No soul is to know about this. Seriously, keep quiet about what we're doing here. The zombies in this neighborhood are as gossipy as you'll get. Especially Jennifer. I swear, she never stops talking about Deborah's divorce. It's not my fault that the Crypt Keeper's refusal to buy cable forces the zombies to watch Gossip Ghouls and nothing else. They've clearly picked up on their obnoxious habits. Also, since when did we care what the dead think? Because if word gets out that we're doing... this, then we're finished. Every magical creature to have ever existed comes from the world of Philando Sirius. Zombies, mummies, ghosts. Actually, that's exactly what we're doing, LaMau! How else are we supposed to get rid of this evolutionary cul-de-sac? You'd think the circle of life would do its job for us, right? But no, now we have to play in the square of death! You get in, get out, and be done with it! But if this doesn't work, how would you destroy it? Hmm? With magic, what else? We fairies gain power through our passions. My reviews give me my spells. But I can't know for certain what abilities I've gained upon completing a review. I do know, however, that they're always themed around what I just reviewed. Perhaps a spell to destroy ghosts? Exorcism? Summoning a portal to some evil spiritual world to imprison it in? Like Florida? Clary, I may be that evil, but you clearly aren't. Just cast some magic pee-pee-poo-poo caca and get rid of it before I change my mind. I haven't used my magic in a while, or at least in the past three episodes or so. So it might have uh, unfortunate outcomes. Huh. For once, our hasty and poorly thought-out plans didn't end in total shenanigans. Good. I'm hungry. Hurry! Foolish fairy and dragon! Did you honestly believe you could banish me into the dust of the earth like- Yeah, after dinner. Want to order a pizza? Hey! Pay attention to your demise! Sure. Where's the phone? You despicable demon! You will pay for forcing us to cook for ourselves! After, after such a scathing review of my mere existence, existence and after you dug, dug me up from my peaceful rest from, from beyond this realm, realm your, your lack of pizza is only the beginning of your blight! You ruined my grave! And since I've lost my home in both my tomb and my afterlife, I shall take your pathetic theater as it is owed to me! Granted, this place is kind of tacky. Seriously, could you pick out a more eyesore shade of pink? But revenge is revenge! What are you gonna do? You are a sentient DVD. Your threats are about as dated as a red box. You have until sunrise, sunrise to return, return me to my, to my slumber, slumber, or else or you and your theater will become my haunting grounds FOREVER! You don't scare us! We have a vacuum cleaner! Gun lover, damn it! Our only weapon! Not quite. You still have your magic. Hurry up and find a ghost-related piece of media to review, and you might be able to make a spell to stop this madness! Oh, but what madness will I have to get through? Casper, the friendly ghost! Casper's Scare School, the animated series, is a computer-animated cartoon based on the pilot film of the same name from 2007 that we looked at last time on this review show, starring no one's favorite sweet-hearted specter, Casper the Friendly Ghost. Me and Sirius already went over the history of Casper himself in the Casper Scare School movie review that you should probably watch before watching this video. Consider it your homework for this weekend. But if you need a brief rundown, Casper the Friendly Ghost was a popular cartoon and comic book series in the 1940s and 50s. A few movies happened, shenanigans and shenanigans, and now we're here at what was, as of this time, the final Casper television series. The show is the written and animated equivalent of an aborted fetus. It's no surprise why it wasn't meant to be. 
The series premiered in Canada on YTV on January 11th, 2009, and then in France on April 1st. Because my jokes are being written for me. <clears throat> and then it finally came to America on Cartoon Network in October, as well as Britain and Ireland being the only people to show a spoopy show during spoopy month. Either they're committed to the bit, or they're imbeciles for allowing it to air in the first place. The show ran for two seasons, each having 52 episodes that consisted of two 11-minute segments in a half-hour time span. Meaning the show technically lasted for 104 episodes between 2009 and 2012. This Frankenstein's monster was cobbled together by Classic Media, who owned Casper at the time before being bought out by DreamWorks, with some help from the defunct French animation studio Moonscoop, most famous for Code Lyoko. But the actual CGI animation was done by DQ Entertainment, also known as DataQuest, a 3D computer animation studio in India that currently works on shows like Miraculous Ladybug. Clary, what are we doing? We just covered all of the hoopla we needed to about this show. Stop giving the people who made it attention! Besides, in case you haven't noticed, there is a literal ticking time bomb of a demon behind us, and if we don't whip up some magic malarkey fast enough, we are never going to see the light of day or eat pizza again! Is that what you want?! I like to be thorough in my research. It helps with the passion and effort we need for a spell, okay? Plus, it's entertaining for the audience. Of course you are. You're not only choosing to film our potential demise, but choosing to focus on a cartoon ghost rather than the one right before us. <sighs> Fine then. Why don't we take a look at Casper Scare School? The show takes place right after the events of the movie and follows the same premise. Casper is a young ghost who'd rather help humans than scare them. Because of this, he's deemed too friendly by the authorities of the monster world, who are supposed to keep up a tradition of terror. So he's sent to a boarding school alongside other creatures such as werewolves and skeletons. The students are now trying to master the art of scaring humans, known to them as fleshies. While Casper tries his best to succeed, he can't deny his gentle nature. This often gets the ghost in trouble with others at the scare school, especially from the school's two-headed headmaster Alder and Dash and the vampire bully Thatch. However, it also lands him with genuine friends who also share a soft side, such as a brainy zombie named Manfa and a dorky mummy named Ra. Casper goes on many misadventures with his friends and foes, as he must be able to graduate scare school before he gets banished from the monster world forever, learning to be a proper haunter, yet still keeping true to himself. Come to scare school. <laughs> well, you go to hell before you die. For the, uh, Casper Cinematic Universe, it's a continuity reboot. It has some similarities with all the other Casper movies and shows, but otherwise is its own separate story. Meaning I don't have to watch a billion other pieces of crap to understand what's going on! Though Casper Scare School did have a spin-off comic series. But who cares? Wait, what did you just say? Who cares? The show is a supernatural fantasy, recycling old tropes seen in school settings such as prom or field trips by adding some spooky quirk to make it seem more unique. The comedy-focused episodes don't do a lot with the scenarios presented, but the show much prefers diving into the magical or science fictional. One of the strengths of this show is that the plots are not very repetitive. The stories themselves are unique, regardless of the actual quality. There's no set formula that gets beaten like a dead horse, which probably could be found at Scare School so I can actually differentiate the episodes. You get something new each time. In the first couple of episodes, for example, we get a story about Casper helping his bully in the human world in secret, Manfa getting new body parts, the students making a monster from cafeteria leftovers, and Ra trying to be a sports star. But the main theme of the show is, appropriately enough, Casper being friendly and helping others. Casper's kindness often allows him to overcome the challenges he faces. And yeah, the students do like causing trouble, but it almost always results in some sort of moral about respect or responsibility. While the show claims to be about a scare school, none of the students or teachers themselves are actually scary. They're very toned-down, kid-friendly versions of monsters. But if the school has no scares, then what does it have? <laughs> School settings offer an ensemble cast, 
most of which usually end up becoming one-note shticks that can be quickly summarized on a sticky note, and this show has a cast that can be quickly summarized on a single sticky note. The only person in this show who is even remotely close to being a decent person is to nobody's shock, Casper. He's your boy scout, your goody two-shoes, your pathetic shrew that we're supposed to root for. To be fair, considering how much everyone else at the school sucks, his kindness actually helps him stand out. As a naturally kind kid, Casper often wants to help others even if they're obnoxious towards him. Non-judgmental and selfless, Casper is compassionate and stands up for causes that he believes in. He's definitely more mature than all of the adults on this show, who are generally portrayed as self-serving, unimaginative, and demanding. Aw, look at Casper. Isn't he loyal and a hard worker, and he tries to get along with his teachers and classmates, and it's just so... <coughs> Apologies. I can't act like I enjoy his type of character. His forced friendliness makes me wretch. <coughs> Even towards the people who would literally toss him into the depths of hell, he'd still choose to be nice to them. Only delving into pettiness when he's felt things have gone too far and needs to teach a bully a lesson. And that's it. He has no character outside of being friendly. Nary a single dream in that head of his. I can't stand it. Despite being an old soul, he's too wishy-washy for me to care about him. I just talked way too long about Casper the Friendly Ghost. I, I, I need medication! I think I also need to discuss the voice acting here. As none of the voice actors from the pilot movie reprise their roles. I'm Casper. Hi. Hello. He's been making trouble at Scare School for years. I understand not having the budget to hire people like Bob Saget or Jim Belushi for a Saturday morning cartoon, hell, they barely had enough budget for a show, but not even the professional voice actors whose entire careers have been Saturday morning cartoons, such as Kevin Michael Richardson or John DiMaggio, reprised their roles for the show. It's a noticeable enough change, but the voices won't be too jarring if you avoided the movie. Replacing Devin Werkheiser, Casper in the show is now voiced by Robbie Sublett. And not that he does a bad acting job, but it's a bit weird. What can I say? I'm not Thatch. He's in real pain. He's got a toothache, and, and if you have a toothache, you go to the dentist, right? I feel bad for calling Devin's voice in the movie unfittingly mature. Devin sounded like a teenager. Robbie sounds like a young adult. It's not like the voice doesn't fit at all. Casper sounds soft and gentle and all that. But it makes me wonder if ghost puberty is a thing in this world. Ugh. But voice aside, Casper is humble, a loyal friend, and he respects pronouns. Tease it more, tease it more. Girls, teasing isn't nice, and Wolfie isn't an it. He's a he. But he can be preachy and a pushover. But Casper still does try to resolve conflicts through kindness. And encourages sympathy to even bullies like Fatch. I dare say he might be a good role model for kids. However, Casper can still be a victim of bad characterization, like in Episode 5, Segment 1, Accidental Hero. As the plot has Casper actively attempting to be scary and trying to be mean in exchange for popsicles. Casper abandons all of his morals for popsicles. We've got to show him he isn't so hot. What? Especially when there are screamsicles uh. at stake. Ooh. I'll give Thatch credit though, he thinks like a winner. And that's what I'm gonna do. No more Mr. Nice Ghost. Casper, the friendly ghost, just said, no more Mr. Nice Ghost. Yeah, I don't care either. At least he tries to redeem himself by predicting the AI apocalypse. Wow, you really are lost in a fantasy world. So, what's next? Are you gonna start eating virtual food and hanging out with computer-generated friends? You gotta get real. Casper tried to warn us, but we didn't listen. We've lost the friendliness in society and became ghosts of our former selves in a complete Casp-tastrophe.
There's only one creature who can save us now. Dude, you've just been fat! <laughs> My beautiful fairies, this magnificent loser is Thatch, voiced by Carter Jackson. In the movie, Thatch was the worst character. He was just a worthless, throwaway bully who wasn't an effective antagonist or an effective nuisance. He failed at even being annoying towards the other students, as Thatch had little to no impact on the plot. But in the show, the one we hated the most in the pilot film turned out to be our favorite. Don't get us wrong, Thatch is still a Thatch hole, but he's the only character who is somewhat consistently entertaining. His voice actor's actually great. He sounds like a punkish preteen who wants to be tougher than he really is. And that fits the character, for what little character there is, nicely. <laughs> Sorry, Flyboy. This is a no-fly zone. Very funny, Thatch. Thanks. I thought so, too. Bootleg Dracula is still fairly obnoxious. He's a self-absorbed twerp who's always on the prowl for attention and glory and likes causing trouble for the rest of the cast. His personality should be a crutch, yet this guy is so proudly one-dimensional, prancing around being an absolute twunt for no other reason than his own sick satisfactions, deluded that he's hilarious in his sheer audacity. I respect Thatch's confidence. A fleshy contest? No. Relax, I won't tell on you. It'll be more fun to watch you make a fool out of yourself. But if you want to hear a real band, check out mine, Fang Day. Since when do you have a band? Since I realized it was selfish to keep all my talent and good looks to myself. Also, he roasts all the characters, which is based. Ha! <laughs> know why a zombie's never won the Super Bowl? Here's why. Brains. Brains. Eek! A zombie. Let's all walk away at a leisurely pace before it eventually gets too close. Though, Thatch's jokes mostly boil down to monster racism. Hmm. However, there are those episodes where Thatch is portrayed as the Thatch hole he's meant to be, but also unintentionally makes perfect sense with the episode's context. Like in episode 2, segue 1, Disarmed and Dangerous, where he points out that bad things started happening right after Mantha gets a new arm. And yes, we will be discussing this episode soon enough, but the thing is that Thatch, while clearly first in line to blame Mantha for something bad, is also making obvious conclusions that the others just aren't seeing. For me, at least, Thatch is usually at his funniest while simultaneously making a good point and being a total jerk at the same time. How come every time Kaibosh comes for an inspection, we're the ones who have to suffer? You missed a spot. But Thatch is at his most legendary when he reaches 1% of his power. In episode 3, segment 1, Thatch commits the epic prank of attempted murder as Thatch utters his utterly iconic Thatch phrase. Dude, you've just been fat! And truly, the glorious moments of fetching are the show's most powerful moments. Where it is a true blessing to be thatched! Where it is truly thatching time as he thatches all over the scare school! In fact, it is now my headcanon that Thatch is the son of Dr. Michael Morbius himself. It all makes sense after all. As Thatch, like Morbius, is truly the vampire of all time. That is where his transcendent abilities come from, and how he is able to control the immense, godlike power of thatching. It is truly a spiritual awakening, nay, a complete rebirth to get thatched. Thank you, Thatch Morbius, for thatching our lives. Unfortunately, not everyone can be as incredible as Thatch Morbius. Let's meet Casper's best friend, Manfa, voiced by Vanessa Bellardini. She's passionate about being a good student and an even better scarer. Manfa is headstrong and snarky, but also supportive and encourages Casper to be scary without necessarily forcing him to. If the script calls for a pep talk of sorts, it's Manfa usually the one doing it. She also calls out people for being stupid, which makes her one of the more slightly not dumb characters in the show. I believe the best way to sum up Manfa as a character 
is Vachig's Velma. You know the one. Calling anyone Velma should count as a slur, Sirius. While she does have moments of intellect, her problem is less so her wit and more her razor-bladed tongue. Her anger has reason at times, such as in episode 9 where Casper, against his will and unable to tell anybody the truth, runs against Mantha's student president campaign which he promised to help her manage. Understandable, sure, but there's a lot of cases where her pettiness is mostly unjustified, and yet the episodes will portray Mantha in the right despite it all. Again, in episode 9, she's angry that Casper left her and Ra one time to hang out with his best abominably rancid friend and his band. Because of course he has a band. So Mantha decides to make Casper suffer and then proceeds to christen herself and Ra as his best friends. I can't believe Casper would rather be in a band with those weirdos than with us. We should show him. Yeah, we should totally show him. Show him what? Show him what it feels like to suffer. After all, we are his best friends. <laughs> I do so love, and I mean love, shallow and clingy jealousy. Especially when the pushover has to grovel and beg for Manfa's forgiveness. Actually, wait. That's another thing. The pettiness is out of control. Child cast or not, these characters will point out the obvious with another character, only to have that character get irrationally butthurt towards the people that are supposed to be their friends. In episode 5, Madva points out the obvious that Ra's new fake friends are using him for his cash, to which Ra gets pissy at his friends and accuses them of jealousy, despite his new friends being the ones who have bullied him the entire time he's been at school, and only start being nice to him after it's revealed he's rich. And with episodes like that, I can share Mantha's frustrations. In the film pilot, they tried setting up Mantha's character as a sort of monster activist for zombie rights, which they did nothing with. So don't get your hopes up in thinking the show would do this plot more justice than the movie. Yes, pun entirely intended. In the episode You Oughta Be In Pictures, Manfo mistakes the background cast of a zombie movie in the human world for actual zombies, and starts a zombie uprising in order to demand respect for what she calls second-class citizens. This is such a fun idea, and it could give us insight on some larger hidden world of how monster class systems work. What monsters are seen as scary and which aren't, how Manfa changes her environments or classmates with actual activism. But no. Manfa is an activist the same way posting a rainbow flag on social media on June 31st and taking it down the next day is activism. If there was a monster equivalent of Twitter, she'd be head of Afterlives Matter and posting vague platitudes about societal ills until her fingers literally fall off and reattach themselves. But my favorite episode happens to be a Manfa-centric episode. The episode about periods. Basically, Manfa explains that once a month, her arm starts going crazy and she usually takes it off or gets it replaced until then. So instead of peeing blood, Manfa loses control of her arm and she gets really cranky. So she gets a new tentacle arm. I don't know how the metaphor is supposed to work. It seems like this is the start of a cute reference to real problems kids face like puberty with a supernatural twist, but then it just delves into the arm causing general havoc. And I think that's the issue with Manfa. She is so close to being decent. But the idea set up of her turned to dust. And she just ends up being a mouthy kid who talks about problems but usually doesn't do much about them, resulting in an inactive activist. Up next in the ghostly circus, we have Ra, the mummy. He's the third wheel of Casper's friend group. And what's his role in it? <laughs> I don't know. He has no identity to speak of. He's trying to be the cool guy one minute, but the other, he's the quirky chimp sidekick. It's not like these two personas are blended into one well-defined personality where each trait acts as a contrast to the other. No, 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 no. It just flip-flops to the point where Ra's personality is flatter than his own bandages. Even the nicer characters tend to do things like gaslighting others into doing what they want and get bitter at people trying to help. 
Oh, poor little Ra is no exception to this, as he comes across as an imbecile even in the episodes that attempt to develop him more. He has no goal like Casper's, I want to be kind to world school, or Manfred's, I want to prove myself and help my friends. So the episodes can have Ra want or do whatever the writers need, because they don't have to worry about character inconsistency if there's no character to ruin. Character goals, even simple ones like Mantha and Casper's, can add so much more. Even if the characters themselves are rather dull. Even though they aren't great, Casper and Mantha having those motivations make them slightly identifiable. Unlike Ra simply not having any. The closest thing to a goal he has appears to be popularity, such as in the episodes The Rominator, Rich Kid Ra, and Wiz Kid Ra. Ooh, fancy titles make me go brr. And as with most cases of this trope of Dork becoming popular, his fans immediately ditch him as soon as the next fad comes along. This motivation isn't really prevalent aside from these few episodes, so it doesn't really count as one for Ra. And what sucks is that this character has potential to be interesting. It's established in a few episodes with Ra's royalty. But this idea of what is essentially a prince in a monster world is never explored. He's dumb, and stupid, and a monster racist! The membership lasts for a year, and you get a t-shirt, a history of the zombie rights movement, and this official zombie power pendant. Zombie power? Please. And no! Having human friends doesn't excuse your fleshy prejudice. Rah! And last, and most certainly least of Casper's friends is his human buddy Jimmy Bradley, voiced by Adam Carter. I hate you, Jimmy. And he also hit puberty last we saw him. You were right, Casper. I can do this! Thanks! That's right. I'm moving. Far away. My dad wants to make a fresh start. His personality is completely different from the movie pilot, too. He hated being scared in the movie, but in the show, he likes it. He is an improvement on the pilot's Jimmy, as he's nowhere near as unlikable. But just now comes across as the generic boy character whose only real defining trait is that he likes horror. He's not interesting at all. But who is interesting is his father, Graham Bradley. Graham is the character on this show who, while I don't like him the most, has the most potential. In episode 12, segment 1, Ghost Bust a Move, Mr. Bradley decides to move in order to find better job opportunities as a salesman. After scaring off Casper and saving Jimmy, he decides to change his business from selling junk to being a monster hunter. And this career change actually stays with him throughout the show. Yep, Jimmy's dad is a monster hunter. Essentially a bargain bin ghostbuster. Now that's actually a really cool concept. The most interesting idea this show presents. Imagine this dorky, white-bred suburban dad as a professional monster hunter. Cracking goofy dad jokes as he stabs vampires with wooden stakes. Or training a werewolf like he would his pet dog. That alone could make for its own cartoon series in and of itself. And the idea of this dad's kid being friends with a child ghost to add some nuance that not all monsters are bad is already an interesting twist. And if you have to throw Casper in there, go ahead. It could work. In episode 23, segment 1, Revenge of the Creature Catcher, Mr. Bradley ends up at scare school with all of his ghost hunting equipment. It's a cool idea that's not terribly executed. But that's the best way to describe the writing. All the interesting things they could do with their settings and characters, they do it. But not always in a good way. If you think, hey, it'd be awesome if this happened, then it most likely will happen. But in the most surface level, uninspired way. As in, the story is there, but the characters aren't compelling enough and the dialogue isn't strong enough. It doesn't even matter at the end of this episode because they erase his memory and return to the status quo. Even though Mr. Bradley is the only one of the characters who broke the status quo. Even in season 2, which we will get to, he's not shown to be one-dimensionally anti-monster and kind of wholesome. In season 2, episode 13, segment 2, Our Boy Wolfie, Graham and his wife Rebecca mistake the werewolf student Wolfie, yeah, real original name there, for Jimmy turned into a werewolf but decide to take care of him anyway because, werewolf or not, they still see him as their son. And it's actually really cute. 
Mr. Bradley is used frequently as an antagonist, though he's often used as just a gag character. But again, that's the show. Get a really interesting synopsis or scenario, and do the bare minimum. You can expect the same level of quality, if not worse, for the side characters. Plenty of the teachers and students don't even get proper names, much less character traits, like Triclops, Pumpkinhead, Flyboy, Franken Gym Teacher, and the best one of them all, Dummy Girl. Uh. <laughs> it's not a playground insult, it's just her name. Oh, Dummy Girl. Ah. Uh. It's no wonder she's a bully on this show, because it's clear her parents hated her and she's not winning any job interviews with that on her resume. It's honestly like naming your child Scab. Some of them, like Wolfie or Flyboy, are almost normal and grounded characters, but the moment they're done waiting to perform on stage, they can easily switch to being total jerk-offs for the sake of being weak antagonists, to usually gang up on Casper or learning a lesson. Mm. Usually kind characters can be jerks in order to develop and change by the end, but because the characters are so garishly undefined, they have no personality beyond whatever the writers haphazardly clamped together. So when they're made to be antagonistic, even for the sake of a moral or a punchline, their entire character becomes single-mindedly jerkish. But when the episode ends, they're right back to being as unimpressively disgusting as the trash I just took out. They don't do anything creative with taking the traits of these monsters to make unique personalities either. I mean, Wolfie acts like a dog and Dummy Girl is an unfunny prankster, but those are the shallowest personalities you could have picked. The only two I can think of that do something clever with their species are Mickey and Monaco, the twin skeletons. They're the shallow, bimbo, fashionista stereotypes. And they're highly decorated and painted Caliveja Catrinas. Colorful and beautiful Mexican skeletons used for the Day of the Dead celebration. See? That's kinda clever! But why not do anything else with the side characters? Have Flyboy be a super annoying jokester, obnoxious like a fly? Have Wolfie be loyal and playful like a dog, but not just have chewing bones and digging holes as a substitute for a personality. Or the teachers, maybe have Miss Hopper, the head in the crystal ball, be super sensitive and fragile like glass. I don't know, I'm spitballing here, but you get the idea. Speaking of teachers, we can't forget about, though we want to, the headmasters of the Scare School, Alder and Dash. This time voiced by Graham Thomas and Roberto Williams. They have the very important job of telling Casper no to whatever he wants to do, and laughing maniacally. They're just as bad as they were in the movie, without the charming voices behind it. They at least have the occasional funny joke, but they're just selfish idiots who do stupid things and get their predictable comeuppance at the end. Often, Alder and Dash derail the main plot with their worthless side stories. That don't contribute to either the episodes or even simple entertaining breaks from the episode's plot lines. And like so many on this show, they're monster racists! Don't you know we have strict rules about things lying around in the hallway? It isn't things, it's my arm. Well, go to the nurse. Uh, maybe she can turn you into a real creature. <laughs> Casper's uncles are also prominently featured on the show, Stinky, Stretch, and Fatso. They are pretty useless despite their frequency. But they do get some comedy I like. Ha ha ha! It's shrinky the. Yeah. Wow! Hey! What if we want our favorite food while we're gone? Here's that pizza place we like. And don't even ask about the human characters, they're even less than useless. But I love the one-dimensional bullies on this show. I mean, everyone remembers Norman! What do you mean you don't have any lunch money? It's Saturday! I hate weekends! Nobody has anything to steal! Who could forget the greatest anime villain of all time? Norman! But even Norman gets an epic redemption arc in Season 2. I'm really sorry, Jimmy. Being a scout isn't stupid at all. I am so happy to be back. Thank you. The cast in this show are fittingly dead. In the sense that they're not lively nor engaging. I would expect that from a real school, where most people there are already sucked dry of their enthusiasm to live, 
but for a cartoony school setting where you can have dozens of interestingly quirky, memorable students and faculty, the show makes the bare minimum effort to make them worth watching. And I know giving all of these characters super complex relationships and personalities would be a Herculean labor, ooh, as well as possibly too complicated for side characters who only are centered in episodes sporadically. But the character traits or goals didn't have to resemble the ancient scrolls of yore, they just had to be there! And when you can't even give these characters proper names or personalities, that says all you need to about the level of care and effort that went into such a monotonous show. Now, dare I mention how ugly it is? Ew! <clears throat> I do not like how the show looks. I can't tell if it's better or worse than the movie. Some obvious improvements have been made in some areas, but it suffers from the same basic design problems. The characters themselves being disproportionate bug-eyed bobbleheads, the textures being muddy, and the environments being flat. It's a pretty ugly show. And it's not because it's meant to be spooky monsters and that, but because it's just poor quality animation. Models are stiff and rarely blink, and they have incredibly janky movement. One thing I will say is that the layout is pretty good. Locations, while minimally detailed, are populated with enough elements such as moving characters and props to make them feel lively. And they make good use of camera work, which is important for a 3D animated series. Like I said, one of the studios involved with the series was Moonscoop. While their most famous show, Code Lyoko, was beloved by many people and had a unique art style that made the show stand out as the iconic sci-fi adventure that's known as today, Moon Scoop wasn't a perfect studio. They also, unfortunately, animated for things such as Quest for Zoo, Norm of the North, Care Bears, Welcome to Carolot. Even Code Lyoko's CGI has aged pretty roughly. But the reason Kolioko is able to get away with outdated looking CGI is that it makes sense within the context of the show. It's about a bunch of boarding school students who enter a video game world to stop an evil virus from breaking out into their reality. Whenever the heroes were outside the video game world, the animation was done in a 2D anime inspired style that's aged very well. When they enter the video game world, it switches to 3D animation to signify a change in setting. The show knew how to use its art direction to its full advantage to help tell its story. This is all brought up because Casper's Scare School doesn't have any art direction to speak of. It simply has shot direction. There's no unique style to the show, resulting in it looking unsurprisingly soulless. It felt like the animators and designers used the excuse of, Well, if it's a spooky setting, we don't need to have a setting with interesting colors or characters that look good. It's supposed to be ugly because it's spooky. But that excuse only holds so much water when the animation quality itself, putting style aside, looks sickly. 3D animation is complex, especially with a cartoon budget. But I've noticed CGI television animation tends to look best when it has strong art direction. Which is why shows mentioned like Code Lyoko look better than Casper Scare School, despite the former being significantly older. Substance and style can carry even the weirdest and most jarring of shows, because they are at least trying to do something interesting with the resources we have. Unlike this show that feels like the ghost of a miscarriage. Look at Fatch's rendering. Look at the scene where they're playing baseball. Look at this portal. Now look at my man titties. Don't they all look better than this show? And it's wildly inconsistent, even with named and established characters. This is Norman in episode 8. Great! I'm super bully. Norman! If you're happy, you must be doing something bad. And this is the same character in episode 10. Today, we will be working with a real fleshy. Norman here thought it would be cool to explore a haunted house. We thought it would be cool to capture him and bring him here. I know him. He's the bully kid who's always picking on Jimmy. Hell, we see his old model in the same episode. 
They can't even keep track of their character designs. <laughs> and because the animation is so rigid, the comedy around it falls flat. None of the slapstick is right, and none of the timing arrives correctly, all due to its abominably slow pacing. Are there any highlights of the animation? Well, only really in detail. animation, is there anything else to talk about? Oh yeah, the voice acting is terrible. Not every actor is bad. Thatch and Manfa are probably the best ones, and Casper too, despite sounding older. But everyone else sounds so unprofessional. The inflections are awkward? The dialogue feels unnaturally spoken. Every emotion sounds disinterested. It legit feels like they hired random people in the studio with no voice acting experience to play some of these characters. Stinky is the absolute worst. His voice actor actually sounds drunk. You're not supposed to take it out of the underworld ever, ever, for any reason, ever. The audio quality is terrible too, especially with voice editing like Kaibosh's voice acting. Students, welcome. Welcome to the Super Bowl. It sounds like a crappy voice filter, without exaggeration. But how is the music? Meh, pretty generic Halloween-esque tunes are littered throughout the show. I guess the genre would be classified as spooky surfer rock? Which, it's nice it has a coherent theme at least, but that doesn't make the music good. The music was composed by Noam Kanyol, who also did the music for Code Lyoko. But again, don't expect anything as good as that show's theme song. In fact, don't expect anything good with this show's appearance. Keep expectations in the grave. Get used to looking at this for 104 episodes. But yeah, this show looks like it's literally rotting away as you watch it. Which I guess is fitting. Both the characters and the animation have failed us. But surely, the writing will save us from mediocrity. Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many basic story issues that even a middle school literary class would grade you badly on if you tried pulling these stunts. There are more times than not where episodes will be poorly paced, with a majority of the content being filler, something extremely common in schlock school setted cartoons. In episode 1, the subplot is Mantha and Rob wanting to see a human concert. But their concert subplot doesn't affect anything within the main story of Thatch going to the dentist. So Madva and Ra can't get concert tickets. Oh, but what a coincidence! The dentist that Casper saw a minute ago just so happens to have two tickets to that exact same concert, and he randomly decides to give them away to Casper and his friends for no reason! And this is the first episode that's meant to sell you on the series if you skipped the movie. Which you absolutely should have, unlike our dumbasses. The writing is incredibly rushed because of a short running time. For example, in the second segment of episode 1, where the students each have 20 seconds to scare dozens of people in Deet's town as part of an assignment. So, during this time... Casper manages to make posters for a haunted house, convince Jimmy to invite his friends to a house, and in 20 seconds, mind you, people literally line the block to get scared by Mantha so she can win the assignment. All in canonically 20 seconds. If it takes this much time to do anything in this universe, I'd be rich beyond my wildest dreams. And I would have abandoned Clary in the Shadow Realm, where she belongs. Wait, what? Character opinions will shift extremely quickly for the sake of a story. Like in episode 3, segment 1, where the students all sing Casper's praises for standing up to Thatch and thank him for allowing them to be nice. And then they're suddenly sick of being nice. But not because they're bad people who don't like kindness, but because Casper politely asked Mantha not to insult people and mistook hair teasing for actual teasing. And because of one instance of Casper being preachy and one instance of Casper being ignorant, the students decide Casper is just as much of a bully as Thatch, who physically and emotionally tormented them every day. Look, 
nobody wants the nice police breathing down their neck all the time. Yeah, in some ways, you're being just as much of a bully as Thatch was. <gasps> What do you mean when I say the characters having no grounded personalities result in bad writing like this? Not to mention, this episode has a rancid moral of making being unintentionally annoying as bad as active, purposeful bullying. Or that innocent mistakes or misunderstandings make you a bully. But some shows aren't meant to teach lessons, some just want to make you laugh. The humor also sucks though. There will usually be one or two jokes every couple of episodes that will get a small chuckle out of me, but it's lukewarm and bland humor-wise. But because the characters are whatever the plot wants them to be, none of the characters have their own unique senses of humor or quirks. Forget about things being established, because it just doesn't happen. In that puberty episode mentioned earlier, Mantha gets a new octo-arm. <gasps> Until the Octo Arm breaks free and joins forces with a robot arm that was never established either by Mantha wearing it or even being mentioned. The writing process truly is akin to tossing darts at a dartboard. Except you replace the darts with feces. The most egregious example of the sloppy writing is with Deetstown, the fleshy city the monsters visit frequently. They can either get to Deetstown by the flying pirate ship school bus, or by a portal. And yet, the show can't decide the rules of this town. Either no one notices all the monsters out in public, or the town is fully self-aware that monsters exist in their world, or the town thinks that monsters don't exist. It changes depending on whatever story the writers feel like crapping out onto the earth that particular day. It's also befuddling with how the monster world interacts with the fleshy world. They only go to Deetstown in the show, but it's established that the monsters have to lay low at times. But in other episodes, Fetch starts a band with Mantha and Ra completely out in the open and casually shows off that all of his bandmates are actual monsters and are still allowed to compete and no one notices a thing. You're not a band. You're not even human. First prize is the brand new version of the video game Guitar Force. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go freak out. Ah! This also happens a lot in season two, which we will get to. When I feel like it. Well, does the show explore cool ideas? Well, in episode 5, segment 2, Casper discusses inequality. It goes nowhere because we're in Casper's scare school. In episode 13, segment 1, we see the monster kids making fun of humans, considering them as ugly as the humans find them scary. The episode is then about Wolfie turning human. And we see Wolfie get discriminated against to the point where Alder and Dash boot him out of scare school. We could have gotten more of Wolfie as a human. Either seeing how he's treated in Deedstown or him trying to live as a human at Scare School. But the discrimination he faces is very surface level. And we neither get much of Wolfie alone with his perspective or him interacting with other monsters or humans. So is there any theme this show does okay? Bewilderingly, I would have to say it's a political episode. Because of course there's a political episode. It's class election season! The Blunderworld King, Shishkebosh, is angry because there's never been a ghost class representative at the school before, thus rigs the election using his power as king to put Casper in charge at the expense of Madva, who was actually passionate about her campaign, for some reason. Thatch, who is also running, sets up fake supporters for both Casper and Madva to smear the other's campaigns, to make them seem unhinged, thus damaging both of their reputations. There's some decent commentary on corruption, political extremism, and those who orchestrate and benefit from it. It's the only episode with a fascinating theme, as every other episode is devoid of themes due to the writing being weak and dead in the water. From Ebola... It's either that, or they just predicted the 2016 and 2020 American elections. In which case, I hate this episode even more than I should. For every glimmer of life, Casper's Scare School is as dull as it looks and sounds. The characters move and sound like they have rigor mortis. And the show is actually based off of a corpse. 
It's an ineffectual effort for a reboot of an old property to try and rake in some easy cash, but the people making it quickly realize it wasn't going to catch on, so they chose to put it down like a lame dog. It's a factory show, most likely created to appease whatever investors Casper still had left and not an actual passion project that the writers or directors wanted to make. They got paid for it, so did the bare minimum with only droplets of creativity to keep this sinking pirate ship afloat. So we made season one sound pretty awful, didn't we? <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. Because that was the good portion of the show. The other half is season two. The second season aired in 2012, with a new opening sequence and a slightly different animation style. And after I show you how worse it gets, you'll understand why the show was cancelled after this. But we have new directors, writers, storyboard artists, and remember all of the times I mentioned Code Lyoko? Well, I hope you liked that show because literally the entire voice cast was replaced by Code Lyoko voice actors. Casper's now voiced by Matthew Getze, who was one of the English voice actors for Odd. Honestly, I think I prefer Matthew to Robbie. It sounds a lot shyer and softer. I think it fits Casper's gentle personality. Hold on, I've got it. You're a boy whose town is overrun by monsters. The scene, you're trapped. And behind that door, a mean, one-eyed, wheezing demon, ready to eat you alive. Huh? And you've no escape. It's also impressive considering Matthew voices pretty much every single male character. And is the second season's voice director. Matthew does good impressions of characters like Mr. Bradley, but he commits the absolute unforgivable sin of ruining Thatch. But, but it's Casper! He disappeared! Well, the red duck, not Casper, it went quack! And it was in his bag! And... Ow! What did you do to him, Matthew? What did you do? Liar! Liar! It's him! He set the whole thing up! He wants me to get punished instead of him! You want proof? I keep getting punished! And he's the nice guy! I could never like little ducks! I'm bad! So shrieky, nasally, whiny, scratchy! What did you do, Matthew? Thatch's voice in this is awful! He legitimately sounds like a cock! And I mean both in the sense of being a crowing rooster and a dick! He sounds more like a parrot than the actual parrot! If Thatch wants to suck blood, he can suck the blood pouring from my earlobes! Huh. <sighs> You'd be a fool to think the horrid voices simply ended there, as the budget of Schmeckles and Moose Bucks allowed a total of five credited voice actors for the entire season. Because of this, other characters like Blunder Dash sound far more egregious. Dash is half-assing a British accent, whilst Alder coped with his brother's existence by injecting helium directly into his veins. In the end, that insufferably cute little duck was not brought here by one of our <laughs> students, but by a parrot who was merely looking for someone to stand in for him. The other voice actors did just as poor a job, with Ra now being voiced by Sharon Mann. Mantha is now played by Mirabelle Kirkland. She also voices... Jimmy! He seems to have succumbed to Benjamin Button disease, as his voice has aged backwards. Casper, I can't act. Funny enough, this Mirabelle lady sounds fine as Mantha, carries the tone and energy of her previous actress, but... Ra sounds like he could unravel your soul with his dismal vocal performance. Casper, that's a great idea! Oh! I've really gotta stop eating in here. The voice acting definitely has that crappy anime dubbing feel. You can feel the awkwardness in the dialogue delivery and the characters constantly talking over each other and making onomatopoeias. How do I put it? You know how voice acting was for video games in the late 90s? And lastly, you've gotta love the school photo they put in the end credits. It's so well designed and rendered! It totally doesn't look like the editors just took the official PNGs of the characters and slapped them into Photoshop! I love how they don't have shadows! The animation is far more kinetic and bouncy compared to the original season, but the cost for expressiveness is the sharp decline in rendering. These are what Nintendo Miis look like after several years in solitary confinement. Look at how choppy this animation is! 
The writing fails to impress as well. Although a few background characters have been given more to do on screen, accompanied by speaking rules. Ooh. Certain characters and NPCs have been tweaked to be given the slightest more depth. More notably, with Fatch having a tender side of playing with rubber ducks. None of what I just said is a compliment, as the writing is still unpleasant for the undead soul. Season 2 as a package is worse than its predecessor. The stories are somehow far less interesting. The voice acting is phoned in, the editing is janky, the pacing's neck is broken, and any sense or logic is abandoned in the graveyard! Season 2 is a monkey's paw for us. We complained that the animation was too stiff, but now it's too snappy. We complained that the pacing was too slow, but now it's super hyper fast pacing that blazes through important plot establishments. We complained that the humor sucked, and now the jokes are rapid fire. Pretty much quantity over quality is the best way I can phrase season two of Casper Schmerschmier. <laughs> plot elements from the first season are recycled too. In episode three, segment two, Veggie Man, they literally reuse the Frankenstein monster made out of food from season one and act like it's a totally different character. Goodbye Jimmy is a repeat of Ghostbuster Move, where Mr. Bradley considers moving. They can't even keep character names consistent. <laughs> <laughs> that? Give Monica her shin bone back. <laughs> I think Pocky put my shin bone on backwards. Problem, oh. Mickey. Season 2 has a ghoulish reputation for its inconsistencies with Season 1. A few examples include, uh... What was the episode? I guess, in this episode, Cappy gets new eyes and manages to make his way to Deed's Town despite the four-part special from Season 1 establishing that he loses all sense of direction when he's not blind. In this very same four-parter, Mr. Bradley finds out Jimmy is friends with Casper. But in later episodes, he forgets Casper. In Our Boy Wolfie, he doesn't know who Jimmy is, despite the fact that this episode is clearly set after... Ah yes, Ghostbuster Nut! as Graham is already a creature catcher by now, in which Wolfie and Jimmy have already met. Yet they also remember details like Mosshead's pet toad from season 1 being a secret. Either there is no sense of continuity, or quite simply, these episodes were released in no particular order and put out into the world via a randomized wheel. I would have put abandoned ship on that wheel, but... alas. Barely any of the episodes managed to keep my interest. There's an episode where Casper purposely splashes Fatch with a potion that's supposed to turn him nice, but instead makes everyone nice to him. Which is kind of funny. I like the episode where they put on a play, that one has a lot of good jokes. But these are two episodes in a season of 52. And they keep recycling the same potion plots for some reason. Episode 8 is about a love potion, episode 16 is about a love potion, and episode 11 has a lovey-dovey kibosh who makes other people lovey-dovey. Like a love potion. You didn't even have enough original stories for one season?! And this season also establishes that Casper has been at the school for four years at this point, And has also won Best Student in all those years. Isn't the concept of this show about Casper being a struggling student? The only episodes that made either of our neurons go burr were those whose plots felt... drugged out? In episode 9, Casper saves a cat from a tree, which gets him in trouble. And then Alder and Dash casually reveal that they have a time machine. No! This is not the same thing as that weird clock thing from last season. Shut up! The purpose of this new time machine that was cranked out of thin air was for the sole purpose of... Oh my god. Not making Casper catch a cat from a tree and letting it die. <laughs> I'm genuinely convinced Alder and Dash use this device of uncontrollable power and possibility to constantly re-eat their finest dish they ate at that closed-down restaurant last February instead of trying to take over the world. Because characters casually having all-powerful devices they never used is another wonderful, terrible trope at our scare school. Either they're as petty and childish as the rest of the cast, or they share a single brain cell, as well as a butthole. <laughs> the most jarring episode is Casper meets Super Chalk, 
where a superhero alien boy with the ability to shoot lasers out of his ears that turn springs into chocolate attacks the school. It's not a good episode, I'm just amazed by the premise. This guy looks straight out of fanboy and chum chum. <laughs> Actually, that's an insult to fanboy and chum chum. Casper, you've somehow managed to take even my lowest expectations for you and run with them into the grave because you've made fanboy and chum chum look pleasant compared to this show. Shame on you. I'm sorry, I need to rant more about Thatch. In season 1, he was ironically enjoyable, but in season 2, he's just annoying. It's primarily due to both the writing and the voice acting. Not only does Matthew Getze sound whiny and unpleasant, not even attempting to sound like the cocky but reasonably pitched Carter Jackson, but his already over-the-top bully personality got stripped of all its sass and hammy confidence. To the point of becoming a petulant toddler who's constantly thinking, How can I be an ass today? without any build-up to motivation or logic to his schemes. In Season 1, it felt like Thatch did this stuff because not only did he find it amusing, but to prove himself superior. He was obsessed with winning. But here, he's just obsessed with getting suspicious with everyone and attempting to ruin their lives. He's not self-serving anymore. He just wants to make others miserable for the sake of it without any benefit to himself, making an already shallow character even more shallow. Like, the episode where he takes over the school should be an epic moment of the whole school getting thatched. But because this thatch is just a big brat, it comes across as corny beyond belief and not intimidating in the slightest. If season one thatch was ranting about taking over the world, I'd be laughing. Here, I'm rolling my eyes out of my sockets waiting for him to get kicked in the bat butt. Which most of these students probably can do. So with all the episodes watched and evaluated, what are the best and worst episodes of Casper Scare School before we talk about the final episodes? Due to the show's episodic nature, Season 1 doesn't have a proper finale, but it does have a four-parter titled Power Outage, which is as close to a season finale as the writers will allow. The entire school is on lockdown due to a monster named Raznik, who steals everyone's powers. There's a lot of action, proper stakes, though I'd rather be eating them instead of watching this. And the characters solve the conflict by using their wits and resourcefulness rather than rely on brute force. It still suffers from a slower pace, a bit of filler, and your armada of cringe jokes. But it's an interesting story. Plus, we even get multiple plot twists that all make kind of sense. King Shishkebob's seemingly loyal leprechaun servant, Raznik, ends up manipulating the heroes by stealing the jewel used to take their powers, which Kib originally intended as a test. Now, granted, Raznik only succeeds in getting what he wants because he tricked Ra into giving him the jewel, further cementifying his incompetence. For once, we see both teachers and students working together to win the day. There is the slightest glimmer of a decent action-packed climax, and Jimmy reveals to his dad that he has monster friends. Because that was probably necessary at some point. Am I right, GAMERS? Every main character gets to do something in the final fight. Even Thatch, who actually gets to help out the heroes with his talent of being a tricky dipshit who outwits Raznik, therefore having the villain get Thatched. I need to wash the taste of that out of my mouth. In this moment, Thatch is less of a bully and more like a semi-friendly, overconfident rival friend of a group who complains and snarks but ultimately helps. God damn it, he's just... he's just Gary Oak. If all episodes were like this one, though... This could have been a show. Could have been. An honorable mention is offered to Season 1, Episode 6, titled Dragon Quest. I could be playing that instead of this shit. In this episode, Casper is going to a medieval-themed restaurant with Jimmy. <coughs> but his science teacher, Professor Burns, talks about how knights were the ancient rivals of his dragon ancestors, and he begins to wonder if he's lost his draconic touch. <sighs> He can't lose it if he never had it to begin with. And he decides to invade the restaurant, mistaking the actors and staff for real knights. Casper pretends to be his helpful squire as he tries to save- 
at the other meat sacks, but genuinely helps his teacher regain his sense of self-worth. It is rather stupid, but if they play it to a competent effort to develop a character like Professor Birds. It's a creative concept, even if the execution is as cliché as the audience thinks it's all part of the show. But the most important part of the episode is that Professor Burns says the meme At last, a worthy opponent. A battle will be legendary. Now that is what we call pretty epic. In this phenomenally and literally stupid episode, Ra eats Fatch's sandwich. Now Ra thinks he's turning into a vampire. And Ra, being so insanely stupid, falls for Fatch's manipulation when he sticks plastic fans onto him and removes the glass from mirrors. And then Ra actually becomes Fatch's servant, not through mind control, but because Fatch literally just told him, LOL, you're a slave now. And Ra believes him despite still having free will and knowing he has free will. What are you doing? Obeying my master. Master? You mean Thatch? I know. I don't like it either, but what can I do? I'm his mindless minion. This isn't a spell or anything. Ra is literally just that dumb that he buys whatever he's told despite the painfully obvious to the contrary. And acts like he's brainwashed with robotic speech and movements because he ate a sandwich. I shouldn't have to explain how painfully stupid the conflict characters and setup is, but I did! And it's not even a season 2 episode! That goes to show how dumb this is when none of the episodes from the awful second season surpassed it! Oh, thank God! We've reached the climax! Now, make it a good one, Scat School! Or else... The first segment of the last episode is To Catch a Monster. And it is about the gang pissing off a spider so the spider fetches the entire school. The spider uses a giant mechanical claw to kidnap everyone until Casper's the only one left. He has to become an epic let's player to save all of his friends who have been turned into T-poses. Casper removes the cobwebs all over the mechanical claw's control panel, Frank and Jim teacher dies, and nothing mattered whatsoever. Yeah, I don't know what I expected. The second segment is No Bones About It, where a rugby, I mean slugby game, is being broadcasted and the scariest student will get to kick off the match. In my opinion, the scariest one is clearly Monaco, who's magically gained the ability to move through solid objects like a ghost. As we can see, her hair and sunglasses appear behind the dish she's meant to be under, and the waiter's chin goes through her head! Then she vanishes without a trace into the night like a truly terrifying monster. Wonderful animation here, guys! You really wanted this show to be over, didn't you? But the episode announces her blonde twin, Mickey, as the winner for dressing up as a Care Bear. And considering I've reviewed horrifyingly bad Care Bear specials before, I'd be terrified too! But Thatch thatches Mickey and she loses her leg, making Monaco the new kicker of the game. So the once inseparable sisters are fighting over who gets to be on TV by fighting over their leg bones. Casper tries to get Manfa to teach Mickey how to control her detached limbs. But third placer Thatch is attempting to thatch off Monaco so he can get the spotlight. But the sisters make up by... Monaco being a jerk for no reason and Mickey getting angry is what brings her leg back to her? Oh, and Mr. Bradley is shoved into the plot in the last two minutes because the writers wanted an early lunch break. And the animators wanted an even earlier lunch break because they forgot to keep the bone on Casper's shoulder consistent and this dog has no rendering. But at least there was attempted character development with Mickey and Monaco. And hey, with Mickey using Monaco's leg to kick the first ball of the game, maybe they were together the whole time. Because maybe the real treasure were the friendly ghosts we made along the way. And the very final shot of this glorious triumph of animated television is Thatch's ass. A perfect, extremely fitting metaphor to end on. And because this show never got a proper finale, it's time for a brand new segment on this review show called Clary Tale Endings, where we make our own ending to the show by determining the characters' fates. Let's go!
isn't scarily bad, but it's just so comfortably uncomfortable in its mediocrity. It feels like the creators weren't passionate about the show at all. So they just mummy walked their way through production with a groan and a paycheck. It's like slow pouring cement, consistently dull, gray sludge. With the occasional bump or crack that's only used to begin a foundation for something better. But this show is just the cement. Any imagination is put into detention. This show will present a creative idea and they will showcase it, but in the most shallow grave, I mean way, possible. And it doesn't leave much room for expanding what it does have in terms of world building or character depth. Casper himself is a likable character and both the students and teachers get good amounts of screen time. But the side characters have ill-defined personalities, goals that change on a whim if they even get them at all, and no development. The stories are varied and take advantage of both the monster world and human world by overlapping these two locations. But the rules regarding how the human world sees monsters or whether or not the monster world wants the monsters to work together or be jerks to each other are inconsistent. I will say that the show never forgets to utilize its premise. Want a spooky school? You get a spooky school that never forgets that it's a school meant to teach the students about scaring others. Plus, the science fiction and fantasy they use can result in some fun stories, adding a new spin on the typical school show. But the more interesting ideas are often one-and-done scenarios that are shelved before their potential is reached. It's just The Walking Dead, only barely kept alive by the occasional spout of effort to keep going. Both the movie and the show have been the last major things to have Casper's face plastered on them. Which is for the best as it was clear both were an ineffectual effort to modernize a cartoon ghost child who died of pneumonia and make him trendy with the hip kids of the 2010s. As you can tell, it didn't work. Nobody behind this incarnation of Casper cared enough to do anything creative and engaging with what they had to work with. Both the show and the movie pilot are twin replicas of blandness with non-existent characterization, stank pacing, and rules and logic that make the town drunk look like a PhD holder. Casper's Scare School was another lazy and floundering attempt in the realm of animation to modernize, and by that I mean make a more childish and chaste trends, an old property no one cared about by, well, not caring. And with effort this non-existent, is it any shock that Casper double died for several years after this show? I haven't seen any of the other cartoons or the movies in the series, and maybe I'll check them out, but after a school semester this rough, I think I'll expel myself, both from Scare School and Casper. Are you satisfied now? Can you rest in peace? You've made us waste more than enough of our lives on your existence. How dare you! I wanted, I wanted to go to, go to the other to the side, side accomplished accomplish and fulfilled, but you rendered my existence a joke! joke. I, will I will do more do than take your tacky clown, clown, clown house. house, I will I take, take your lives! Serious, quick, the sun's rising! All right, you terrible show hosting a terrible creature. It's time to get exercised with my Clary magic! Did it work? I have no idea, but... Clary, look outside. Dude, you've just been- <laughs> 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 The ghost. It got thatched. Was it saved by a meme? What's important is that it was saved at all. It's free in death's peace. Not confined to humanity's failures in life. It's no longer trapped in crap. Clary, do you think this could be a metaphor for not getting consumed and controlled by negativity and freeing yourself of those burdens through humor and friendship? Or did we just need to rush this out for October? Hey, we need more wholesome Halloween specials out there. Besides, even a scary story could use a happy ending once in a while.